Okay, so um, today we're gonna talk about training methods. Now I realize that I'm not here to actually talk to you in person. Um, so what you're gonna need to do is you have guided notes that go with this. So you can either um, listen to this on somebody else's computer and you can type on one of yours and share your notes or you can listen to it by yourself and split your screen so you can follow along with the PowerPoint and type your notes. Um, you can put me talking in the background and then you can type your guided notes in the front as long as you can follow along with what I'm talking about. Um, you're going to have to pause my um, YouTube of the lecture so that you can watch the videos. I'm not gonna play them for you, but I will stop talking and take a break. So that way I know that um, you have time to pause the video and start the uh, YouTube videos that are embedded in this PowerPoint. So we're talking about training methods. There are many styles, there's many types of training methods and um, I'm open to always learning about new types. Um, there is no wrong training way, there is no right training way. Um, I think there's a lot of different styles and methods out there and as long as you find something that works for you and the animal that you're training, um, that's all that matters. As long as you both are happy and comfortable and um, you're getting the outcome you desire, that's the training method that's gonna work best for you. So, um, there's a saying that goes with training methods and it's that the only thing two experienced trainers can agree upon is that the third one is wrong. And so basically what that means is that when you have three people that are training a similar type of animal or two people that are training a similar type of animal, they always think that their method is best. They're always going to say, my way is the best way and your way stinks. Um, and the only thing they might agree on is that the other person is doing it wrong because their day, their, your way is right, their way is right, and theirs is definitely wrong. So um, just kind of a funny thing. So like I said, as far as I'm concerned, as long as you're both coming to a happy conclusion of your training um, and you're, if both you and the animal um, are happy during the training, then um, you're probably doing just fine. So um, different training styles exist. Um, they're all composed of just a few basic concepts. Um, it's the applications of these concepts that differ. So it's all about finding the same outcome, um, but it's just different methods, whether that be positive reinforcement or whether that be um, negative reinforcement, those kind of things. Um, it all comes to the same outcome that you ask the dog to sit, they sit, and everybody's happy. Okay. Um, the method that you choose, um, you need to choose what's going to work best for you, what's going to work best for your animal. And that may change depending on your animal. So maybe what you use with one dog is not going to work with the next dog. What you use with one horse might not work with the next horse. Um, you have to consider the animal, um, the animal's behavior, the animal's history, and then that will help you choose a training method that's going to work for you both. Here's your lesson goals. I'm not going to um, read these to you because you can read. The methods we're going to cover are going to be classic, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, traditional training, science-based training, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, clicker training, and counter conditioning, okay? And when you guys get to practice a training method, which you will, um, you get to choose one of these or a combination of these. So classical conditioning. Classical, con classical conditioning refers to the learning process uh, where learning occurs by association. Now that can be good association or it can be bad association, okay? So um, this conditions your pet's um, innate reflexes to react to subtle signals. Over time, the pet learns to associate the signal with an event, okay? So if every time um, you feed your dog, you sing a song, every time you sing that song, the dog is gonna associate that song with you feeding the dog, okay? That's a good association. If every time you um, put your dog in the backyard, the neighbor's dog barks at it and it gets scared, it's gonna be associated being in the backyard with the neighbor's dog barking and that, that's being a scary thing, therefore the backyard is a bad place, okay? So this is what's known as uh, the Pavlonian um, law. Um, which he was a famous, uh, Pavlov's uh, dogs is something that you guys may have heard of before. Um, sometimes I think when I'm lecturing uh, live that uh, the students, I'll ask how many who's heard of Pavlov's dogs and like I have like about two people raise their hands. So some of you probably have heard of him, some of you haven't. But he was a Russian um, physiologist, um, or actually he was a psychologist, who discovered that dogs automatically salivated when presented with food. 
So he trained his dogs to associate the ringing of a bell with the presence of food. So eventually, he was able to just ring the bell and the dogs would automatically salivate because they associated that ringing of the bell with food. So it occurs on a daily basis without us even thinking about it, all right? So, um, for instance, you grab your dog's leash, they start bouncing around, they need to go for a walk. Um, in the morning when I pack up my stuff, if I grab the truck keys, the dogs know that the sound of the truck key is different than my car key. They know the truck keys, they get to go with me, so they get bouncy and they get excited because they know they get to go. Um, you grab a food bowl, your dog starts to salivate. You grab your cat's favorite toy and squeak it or rattle it, it comes running. Um, you walk into your horse's stall by horse people with a bridle instead of a halter. Your horse knows we're going for a ride. It's time to work. Um, they do this with um, stallions in um, barns where they're breeding. They use certain halters for, they maybe only use a leather halter when they're using the stallion for breeding and they use nylon halters otherwise. Or the chain for the uh, horse might go um, um, under the lip across the gums when they're going to be using them for breeding. Otherwise, when they're handling the stallion, maybe the chain goes under, under, the, um, under the chin. So things like that um, help them associate with what's about to happen. Um, I know people that train dogs like this. If they're um, taking their dog out to go hunting, they only use the leather lead when their dog's going hunting instead of just going for a walk. Um, you can do this with all kinds of things, smells, scents. You can do it with um, um, the feel of certain, uh, like I said, certain types of materials, the so leather, collars, things like that. So it helps your animal form positive associations with all sorts of stimuli, right? For example, feeding an animal in an area it's afraid of, like a horse, feeding them near the trailer or in a trailer, helps them associate that with a good thing. Feeding a dog in a crate associates the crate with a good thing. They get treats or they get food when they go in their crate. If an animal is afraid of men, they only get a special high reward, high reward treat from men when they visit, okay? so. Maybe it's hot dogs or canned chicken. When um, the male comes into the house, you give him a piece of hot dog, they feed the dogs a hot, a hot dog, they start to associate men coming in the house with hot dogs. That's a good thing. They like hot dogs, they're happy. Um, peanut butter on the wall on nail trimming. Instead of them worrying about, worried about you trimming the nails, they're licking the peanut butter off the wall. They associate that peanut butter on the wall with a good thing and, and eventually will associate nail trimming with a good thing. This is a great method when you're introducing new things to an animal, okay? You find something they already like, whether it be brushing or food or treats, and then you introduce that thing they might be afraid of while you're doing that high reward thing. So you guys can watch this video on Pavlov's dogs. It's gonna kinda explain what cla uh, classical conditioning is. It's gonna talk about um, Dr. Pavlov's dogs and you guys can watch this. So now we're going to talk about operant conditioning, all right? Operant conditioning is a method of training based on, sorry flies, as usual, right? Um, is based on controlling the environment so that a behavior results in either a pleasant or unpleasant sequence or consequence. Um, and this is called positive and negative reinforcement. Now, positive and negative reinforcement doesn't mean beating your dog, okay? So don't associate negative reinforcement as in I'm going to beat my dog and that's how I'm going to train them. That is not what that means at all. Negative refers to taking away. Positive refers to adding something, okay? So just like in math, positive is adding something, negative is taking something away. So the animal performs a certain behavior and something good happens. That's one example. The animal performs a certain behavior that results in a bad consequence, okay? So this doesn't necessarily mean, like I said, doesn't necessarily mean beating your dog. So, if they perform a certain behavior and something good happens, that is going to increase the likelihood that they're going to perform that behavior again. If an animal performs a behavior and results in a bad consequence, over time they're going to decrease that behavior because they don't like what happens when um, that behavior is done, okay? By punishing bad behaviors, we can decrease them, and by reinforcing good behaviors, we can increase them. And again, punishment does not necessarily mean what you actually think it does, okay? So, just like I at, talked about, positive refers to adding something and negative refers to taking something away, okay? So, in positive reinforcement, we're going to add something in that the dog sees as pleasant. Or in, case, in this case, maybe high praise treat. So, you ask the puppy to sit. 
It sits, you give them a treat, you're adding something in. You're, po you're presenting them with a treat. You're adding that treat in, that's positive reinforcement, all right? So, positive punishment would be um, you could decrease a waiver, decrease behavior by adding something that the dog sees unpleasant, okay? So in positive punishment, um, your dog jumps up and you put your knee up, that's adding something that they don't like. You're not kicking them, you're just putting that knee up so they hit your knee, they don't like that, they learn when they jump, I come in contact with the knee and my chest, I don't like that, I'm gonna stop doing that behavior, okay? Negative reinforcement, you're going to take something away, okay? Um, so for example, in this case, um, if you're pulling up on your dog's collar until he sits, so you're asking the dog, dog to sit and you're pulling the collar, the, the leash and collar this way away from him and it's causing this to happen and he sits and the pulling stops, he realizes that when he feels that pressure, if he sits, it'll stop. So what you're doing is you're taking the unpleasant thing away. You're taking away the pressure that he doesn't like, okay? Um, negative punishment is decreasing, is decreasing a behavior by taking away something that's desirable, something the animal wants to happen, okay? So, you want to play fetch, but every time you go show your dog the ball, it jumps up and tries to grab it out of your hand. So, instead of having the toy there in front of him, you take the toy behind your back, okay? So now he can't see it. So he's taken away what he wants to see, okay? He knows that he cannot get the toy until he does the behavior you want from him, so he stops jumping. So he knows that you'll only play fetch when he's not jumping on you. So you're taking something away that he wants. He's, you're taking away that ball. It's a punishment because he wants the ball, but you're taking it away, and that's a desirable behavior. So that's negative punishment. So taking something away that's desirable, okay? Um, negative reinforcement, taking something away that's unpleasant, okay? In this case, negative reinforcement is something we do with horses, okay? When you ask a horse to turn and you gently pull on that rein, you're applying pressure. They don't like that pressure, but when they do what you want to do, that pressure is released, okay? That's negative reinforcement. It's not mean, it's just applying pressure. So, operant conditioning. You guys can watch this video on operant conditioning on your own, and then we'll reconvene at the next um, training method. Traditional training, okay? Traditional training. So, traditional training is used to describe methods that are predating modern science-based methods. So. Um, it's methods that we more often use today. This is more like old school training. Um, and it makes a use of adversives and punishments and physically coercing an animal to do something. Most people do not use this method of training anymore because we know there are better ways to form better relationships with our animals. This is a little bit more of a dominant and fear-based training, okay? So this comes from um, the dominance theory of wolf pack. Um, which has been actually debunked. Um, so they actually don't use um, wolf pack theory anymore. And it actually, um, wolf pack theory, wolf packs are actually used made, made up of family members. And it's a hierarchy because mom and dad are in charge, just like at home. Um, but they'll talk more about that in a video. So um, traditional kind of training allows the animal to make mistakes and then punishment is given to lessen the behavior in the future. So it's, the theory goes is that animals behave badly because they assume that they are the dominant ones and we have to prove that we are dominant, okay? Um, and so we spend a lot of time in this training method asserting our dominance as the alpha, okay? So the dog is asked to sit, it doesn't, the owner shoves the butt down um, or maybe uh, gives them a little tap on the butt with a leash, no, sit, okay? Um, eventually the dog um, is forced to sit but no reward is offered for the behavior. The only reward that's offered is that um, is that I'm not mad at them anymore and I, they know I'm not going to smash them after they've sat down. Eventually, when the animal offers that, when you say sit and the animal offers that behavior on their own, then they get praise and a treat. Um, but it's because they literally are operating out of fear and knowing that if they don't do what they're, if they don't don't figure out what they're supposed to do something bad is gonna to happen to them. So that's why this training method has kind of been gone away from. Um, they, 
Uh, traditional trainers use corrections such as a sharp snap on the leash, pinches, grabs, alpha rolls when bad behavior is seen. Um, most do combine this with praise um, and rewards for reinforcement, um, but this is um, like a Caesar, Caesar Milan kind of training method, which is why sometimes he gets a bad rap. Um, and a really good example of this, um, which some people have, may have used before, and, and I was guilty of this when I was young and trying to train animals to walk on leads uh, for a show, but um, my dairy heifers. But the steer won't walk on a lead. Instead of trying to coerce them and teaching them manners and how to walk with me and using rewards, we tied our steer to the back of a tractor or a four-wheeler and they were forced to walk behind until they walked. So they learned that if I don't walk, I'm gonna get drugged and so I have to walk. Um, they do this with sometimes with really stubborn horses. They'll tie um, colts up to donkeys um, and the donkey drags the uh, colt around the pasture and the colt learns that when that I get that tug, I need to follow whatever's tugging me because if not, I'm just gonna get drugged. Um, and so they, that, I still see that method used a lot of times and they just call that um, basically breaking, um, using a donkey to break, break a colt, so donkey colt breaking. Um, and I know people that still teach their steers to walk by tying, so tying them to a four-wheeler four and forcing them to walk behind the four-wheeler. Um, again, not, not a method that we like to see used, but a method that still gets used sometimes. Okay. So this guy's going to talk about the alpha wolf um, and if that and why that theory's kind of been gone away from, and but it kind of helps you understand where we're coming from with the alpha dominance thing. Okay, science-based training. Science-based training. So this is based off of what we've learned over the last um, probably 40, 50 years studying animal behavior. Okay. Um, it's clearly hard to define into a single all-encompassing definition, but basically um, it's training based upon the deep under understanding of animals, their nature, their behavior, it, operant conditioning, classical conditioning, punishments, reinforcements, and much, much more goes into this. But it's a lot more like basically asking the animal to cooperate with you versus forcing them to cooperate with you. So um, it's constantly being developed. We're always changing it because we might find better methods or things that work better. Um, behaviorists um, are a big into this. Um, but it really stands apart from our traditional training methods is because we truly want to understand different training methods for different animals. And that's right down to the individual animal. Um, Science-based trainers know certain theories have been debunked and proven false, um, and they know that coercion and phys physical punishment is unnecessary, and it's, um, we're, we're, we don't want the animal to obey us because they're fearful of us. They are, we want them to obey us because they want to please us and because they want to work with us. Okay, so we train the animal in the most humane ways possible, at, taking into um, account the uh, animal's psychological needs um, and way of learning. Uh, we try not to rule them with an iron fist. Um, and as all these studies are undertaken and new evidence comes to light, old theories are thrown out, new theories are brought in. This is um, used a lot in zoos. Um, and that's because um, we're constantly studying animal behavior and learning about different animals and trying to find the best way to work with them and make them comfortable in their captive habitat as comfortable as they could be in a natural habitat. So. Um, Majority of science-based training centers um, on operant conditioning, um, they take many factors into account, um, but most of them are operant conditioning, so making them comfortable. Um, so before we try to change the behavior, we look at everything surrounding the behavior up to that behavior. So we talked about behavior. In order for there to be behavior, there must be a stimulus. Um, so we got to look at what caused that animal to react that way and how can we change the environment and what's around them to find a behavior that's appropriate. That's, that's kind of more what we um, are looking at with science-based training. Positive reinforcement of training. Most of you guys have probably used this at home. Um, it's very common in training. It's a part of operant conditioning, um, but when it's used to describe a sole method of training, it refers to a trainer who is exclusively using positive reinforcement and um, that's really the only techniques they're using. So like I said, a lot of times these are combined. We're talking about these just very specific right now. 
Good behaviors get rewarded, but bad unwanted behaviors simply get ignored. So, it can work to use only positive reinforcement, but it's not always very effective because the animal is always guessing what behavior was wrong. Um, it can result in bad behaviors getting worse because just by ignoring them, we're allowing the animal to find their own reward and hence the reinforced behavior, okay? So a really good example of this is that you have a dog that chases squirrels and you don't want it to chase squirrels. But instead of telling them that that's wrong by saying no or um, going and grabbing them and putting them back on the leash and taking them away and making them not do that behavior, they don't learn not to do it because it's fun to chase squirrels, right? I mean, it's fun to go chase something down the street and laugh and giggle. It's, it's, it's fun to do that. And the dog is getting rewarded in their own way by chasing squirrels. Um, so even though you're not rewarding the behavior, the dog is rewarding itself because it's enjoying what it's doing, okay? Um, the dog found his own reward, own reward in that happiness and that exhilaration of chasing the squirrels. And it's probably going to want to do it again. So instead of the bad behavior being... Um, even though you're not reinforcing it, the dog is reinforced the bad behavior. So um, that's why using this alone isn't a great strategy. It's usually some, tor some, some form of punishment, whether that be positive punishment or negative punishment, must be um, added. So that way, um, whether you're taking something away or um, adding something in to stop them from doing that behavior, it would help this method versus just doing it on its own. Okay, so we're going to talk about positive reinforcement here, more in the classical way that you, you would be used to, as in you're rewarding a behavior we want to see. Negative reinforcement training. So negative reinforcement training is taking away something undesirable to increase a behavior. Again, the word negative here doesn't mean bad, and it does not mean we're abusing our animals. It means we're taking something away, okay? So negative reinforcement's a tricky one because um, we can also see it as positive punishment because the same action can either be viewed as um, taken away or added depending on the outcome, okay? So again, I talked about positive punishment with horses and applying pressure. You're adding something in. However, when you take that away, it's a negative, okay? So you're taking something away. Um, the horse learns to turn left when the left rein is pulled because by doing that, it can relieve the tugging on its face from the left corner of its mouth. So when I add that in, I add that when I'm gently pulling on or when they're first learning, I might have to really pull to get them to turn. And then eventually it can just be a gentle movement, that tugging on the corner of their mouth, they don't like that. So they turn left because by turning left, they relieve the pressure. So that's negative reinforcement. The pressure goes away when they turn, okay? Um, your horse does like the feel of the tug of his mouth. Or to relieve it, he turns left. Um, the bad stimulus was removed. And the behavior of turning um, with the pull of the rein is reinforced, okay? So that's where, the, that's, that's where you can get these two confused because they sound a lot alike. Positive punishment is you pull on the rein to prevent him from going um, straight, therefore you added a punishment to prevent a behavior. I know some of this stuff's kind of a little confusing, but just think um, positive punishment, you're adding something that they don't like, negative reinforcement, you're taking away something they don't like. So that's why they sound kind of the same, okay? So just remember, negative takes away something, positive adds something. Okay, so negative reinforcement, positive punishment. Negative reinforcement can be used to, um, to shape behavior as well as with positive reinforcement. Um, one must be prodding when the response is correct, okay? So that's what's really important here. You can't continue to apply the pressure to get the reward you want, okay? so. The horse turns its head, you've got to stop applying pressure because that is their reward. The dog, um, the, you're, pull, you're asking the dog to come. You want him to take two steps. He's got all four feet in the sand. You're applying gentle pressure at least, applying a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more until he finally takes that step. When he takes that step, you release the pressure. If you keep applying the pressure, he doesn't realize that when I step, the pressure goes away, and that's the that's what you're trying to teach. So you have to be really on your game in this method to make sure that um, that you're 
asking them to do, that they're understanding that you're asking them to do something and even though they don't like that tug of the collar, if I do what he wants me to do, that tug will stop. Oh, that feels much better. Okay, so the next time I start to tug, oh, he tugs, I'm gonna take a step so that stops it. Does that make sense? Hopefully. So just remember, negative simply means you're taking, taking away something undesirable to increase a behavior. Negative does not mean beating your animal. You're just taking away something undesirable to increase the behavior we want. So think about you're pulling on a leash to get them to take, to, to get them to take a step. You're pulling on the reins of a horse to get them to step forward. They step forward, the pressure's taken away. <sighs> Everybody's happy, the horse is happy, the pressure's gone, you're happy because they did what you want. So they're gonna talk about negative and positive reinforcement in this video, and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense to you guys. Clicker training. This one's pretty popular. We hear a lot about clicker training. I have clickers in the kennel, the little click clicks. Um, and the clicker training uses a little handheld device to create a sound that you use when, to mark the point which your animal completes a desired behavior, okay? Um, it's easier to more accurately mark where the desired behavior ends with a click than it is with your voice, okay? And we um, will do a fun activity with this once I get back, okay? All right, so communication between you and your animal is much better due to quick recognition of desired behavior. And that's where the clicker training comes in because they learn to associate that click with exactly the behavior you want. So that behavior might be putting a paw on something. So maybe they're trying to figure out, you're, you're trying to get to put a paw, their paw on something, but you, you're trying to like put the paw on something, you stand up and they finally put the paw on it versus saying, good dog, you get the clicker and they realize that that is um, going to work. Clicker training is really, really good for cats and zoo animals. So, obviously you have classical conditioning where you're using the mark as a good behavior with a click and then a treat as the reward, okay? So they get two good rewards, okay? After many repetition, your animal soon associates the clicker with the reward so that the treats can be phased out, okay? Operant conditioning, then you use the clicker for positive reinforcement. They know that that click is a good sign. That every time that you click, it's a good behavior. And so then you're able to do things from across the room. And that's where um, people that you see like um, animals that are doing things and they're asking you to do anim animals to do things across the stage or something like that. They use the click to still reinforce the good behavior. So um, you can also use a command like good or yes. Um, and that also can turn into another um, um, turn into another like reward along with the click. Um, and then obviously, then you can ask them to sit. They sit, you click, and you're happy. And this, sorry, there's a fly on my screen, obviously, somewhere. You guys can um, learn more about it at clickertraining.com. And then this video is going to talk about clicker training with cats, so it's pretty cool. Counter conditioning. All right, counter conditioning. A technique used in dog behavior modification to change the way the dog feels about something. You, this is also can be done with horses and cattle. Um, it's be used with um, zoo animals, but it's changing the pet's emotional response or feelings or attitudes towards towards the stimulus. Okay, so we're trying the way they, trying to change the way they truly feel about something. Okay, so. It works best when combined with desensitization, okay? And that means you're gonna safely expose an animal to the stimulus that causes the behavior we don't want at a level below which fear is likely to be exhibited, okay? So for example, when you're introducing a baby colt or a horse to a halter, rather than just putting it on them and making them figure it out, you start out by just maybe rubbing it on them and rubbing it all over them while you're feeding them their favorite sweet feed. Um, and maybe the next day you just drape it over their neck or over their over the top of their head and while you're feeding them with that sweet feed, okay? Um, you're gonna treat, offer them treats and pet them and praise them. And then maybe the next day you're going to just put it over their head and take it off immediately. And then put it over their head and take it off immediately. And they get used to kind of that, that thing being near their face but it doesn't bother them. And then maybe the next day you put it on and you leave it on, but you don't latch it yet. And then they can kind of, if they want to rub on, rub on it and rub around, you let them rub, they can rub it off, it's not a big deal. And then finally, obviously, you continue with this process a little bit by little bit, 
until you're able to place it on the, the head and latch it without the um, horse freaking out or fighting you. So counter conditioning is used to change the animal's attitude or emotional response to the stimulus. In this case, with the desensitization, we're desensitizing to the holder. They, when they see the holder now, they don't associate it with a bad thing. This is really good to use for anxious or frightened dogs. Now, it takes a lot of patience on your part, um, but uh, they, use, they use this to help change the, do the way the dog, or dog feels about a, maybe a person or a place or a thing, okay? Um, the use of punishment rarely works when you have an anxious or frightened dog because it just increases the anxiety and increases the fear, okay? Um, so what we want to do is we want to try to make them feel better about a place or a thing, whether it be a car, whether it be um, lightning, those kind of things, okay? Um, a critical element of success is to prevent any exposure that might lead to negative outcome during training, okay? So we don't want to push them to the point of fear, anxiety, or aggression. So that means when I start to see the body language shift to fear, anxiety, and aggression, we stop, we back up, we don't go any further. So that's why I said it takes a lot of patience on your part. Um, a little bit at a time, and you have to, have to, have to read every sign of body language that you can. So you've got to be looking at those ears, the tail, the eyes, the mouth. The you got to be looking for lip licking. You've got to be looking at... Um, Looking at the pupils, are they dilated? Are are they are they are they constricted? Are, is, the, is the animal starting to crouch? Those kind of things. You need to watch for those signs. Um, and it's very important to use high desired rewards for as a distraction or for reinforcement. And I mean high desired hot dogs, canned chicken, cheese, tuna, whatever it is. You have to find something that is like their favorite thing in the world. And you only use it when you're working in this in this case against something they're afraid of. Okay, so maybe you have a cat in your house that's fearful when exposed to a visitor to the cat in the home. So obviously you're not just going to have a bunch of people come over and be like, all right, good luck. No, you're going to, what, what you're going to do is you're going to um, offer the cat those favorite rewards in the presence of a visitor. But rather than having the visitor just walk in, you might just work with a friend and have them stand up on the other side of a door and they'll get used to that smell of someone different on the other side of the door. Um, now, if the cat got sick, scared on the first of the side door and went and hid, then obviously it's too much. So you gotta try something else. So maybe instead of trying to feed the cat right next to the door, we feed the cat in the dining room where it can still smell the person on the other side of the door, but they feel safe in the dining room. And then maybe we move that closer and closer to the door. Then maybe we have the person stand outside the door, but the door's open. We're still feeding the cat in the dining room, those kind of things. But every time the cat shows that fear or anxiousness, we back up a step. Anytime that they allow us to continue, then we can um, then we can continue on with our training. So small steps until everybody can be in the same room without fear or anxiety in this case. Okay. So this is going to talk about desensitization and counter conditioning. Um, this is uh, Dr. Sophia Lin. Um, she um, is amazing, and you can watch all of her YouTube's on. Um, for free on the internet. She's phenomenal when it comes to training. Um, she's a wonderful resource, Dr. Uh, Sophia Yin. Um, unfortunately, she's dead. Um, she passed away, she had cancer. But um, she is world renowned as a veterinarian and, and a behaviorist. This video is really good on desensitizing. Um, this talks about desensitizing a horse to like a tarp. Um, and this was really good to watch. And um, you guys will really like this one. I've actually done work like this with horses. Okay, so just some tips and tricks for training, all right? You always want to keep your goals small. Your big goal might be eventually you want to be able to ride around the arena with a flag, holding a flag with your horse, okay? Now, that's the big ultimate goal. Full gallop with that flag. That's your ultimate goal. However, your first goal just needs to be, I need to be able to get a flag around my horse. That's your first goal. So you're going to start out with maybe a small Walmart bag, and then maybe a tarp, and then maybe just the flag waving around the horse, maybe just this, this flag pole around the horse. It's going to be small, and it's going to be months of small steps towards what you want, okay? Too much, too fast is going to be confusing and frustrating for the animal as well, okay? 
Use high reward treats, okay? Something that you're not using every day. Chicken, spray cheese, hot dogs, peanut butter, something that is not an everyday treat. So now we're not talking milk bones, okay? Um, we like spray cheese because it's non-dairy. Dairy can upset stomachs. So Amer most American cheese is non-dairy as well. Kraft American cheese. Um, but spray cheese, Kraft American cheese um, are high reward treats. Keep commands simple. Use short phrases and words, okay? Do not talk to your pet in long sentences. They don't get it. Short phrases and words. Sit, down, stay, come, lie down, um, roll over. Stuff that's simple for them to understand. Obviously, trial and error. You may think you have the best training method figured out in the world, and you go to work with that animal and things aren't working. Modify it. Go do some more research. Figure out another training method. Try something different. If it's not working for that particular animal, you're going to have to try something else. So don't be afraid to be like, this isn't working. We need to try. We need to go back to the drawing board and go back to the drawing board because the best training method is the one that works for you and works for your animal to get the desired outcome. Reward immediately for progress, all right? Anything more than 10 seconds, your animal is already confused what you're asking for, okay? For example, you want to train your dog to go to the bathroom outside. If you reward them after they come back to the house and don't reward them immediately, they're not understanding that they're supposed to go to the bathroom outside. The reward and the praise needs to become immediate. So as soon as they squat to feet, good dog, here's your treat. I mean, immediately. They know that's what's supposed to happen outside, okay? Um, keep training sessions short. Now, obviously, when you're walking your dog, it might have to be a long walk to get on the potty. But um, when you're trying to teach him to sit or you're trying to teach him to lay down, 15 to 20 to 20 minutes for puppies and 20 to 30 minutes for adults. Anything longer than that, they're over it, they're done, they've had a lot of mental focus, they don't want to do it anymore. Um, and these training sessions should be done every single day. You should be working with your dogs. I work with my dogs while I'm brewing coffee in the morning. I have a bun. It takes 10 minutes to brew coffee while I'm brewing coffee. I'm rehearsing commands with my dogs. And my dogs sit on command. My dogs lay down on command because I work with them every day. And those commands, I hear them over and over again. They associate them with good things because they know they're getting my attention. They know they're getting love. They're getting treats. But again, it's 10 to 15 minutes and we're done. I've given you guys some references here that I want you guys to check out. Um, you guys may have seen these guys on TikTok, No Bad Dogs, but Upstate Canine Training Academy, they work with a lot of aggressive dogs and really big dog problems, but they have some really good, they have some really good stuff on puppy training as well. So does Zach George's Dog Training Revolution. For cats, this cat school clicker training, so good, so, so good. Um, and then Jackson Galaxy, my cat from hell, you guys probably recognize him. He's got a lot of um, cat... Um, cat training method stuff as well. So if you have time, I expect you guys to go through and watch some of these videos because you guys are going to be assigned a training, um, a training project later. And it would be good to already have kind of an idea of where to start by watching some of these videos. If you guys have questions that Miss Rogers cannot answer, please feel free to email me. Okay. I miss you. I hope you're having a good week.